we're moving slightly away from the biology, just for a brief section, and we're going to talk more about artificial intelligence and then how it links with biology and the brain in this session. So our first speaker is Murray Shanahan, who's Professor of Cognitive Robotics at Imperial College London. He's also a senior research scientist at Google DeepMind, which is the world leader in artificial intelligence research that's on a scientific mission to push the boundaries of AI to solve any complex problem uh, without needing to be taught how. So hopefully that will make all of our lives a little bit easier. He's also on the external advisory board for Cambridge Centre for the study of existential risk. He graduated from Imperial with a first in computer science in 1984. He obtained his PhD from Cambridge University in 1988. And since then, he's carried out work and published on artificial intelligence, robotics, logic, dynamical systems, computational neuroscience, and philosophy of mind. His book, Embodiment and the Inner Life, was a significant influence on the film Ex Machina, and he was a scientific advisor on that movie. His current book, The Technological Singularity, runs through various scenarios following the invention of an AI that makes better versions of itself and rapidly outcompetes humans. So I hope that, that that's a nice kind of lead on from Isaac Asimov, where he brought us with AI in the 60s. So please join me in welcoming Professor Murray Shanahan. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to this uh, remarkable event, and it's a particular honor to be in such uh, esteemed company. Okay, so my plan here is to situate my field of artificial intelligence uh, in time. So, uh, so that has a, my talk has a nice, simple structure. I'm going to talk about the past, the present, and the future. Um, okay, so first of all, First of all, the past. Um, well, it's common to trace the origins of the field of artificial intelligence to a conference that took place in uh, the summer of 1956, the so-called Dartmouth uh, Conference. And this was organized by uh, John McCarthy. And John McCarthy coined the term artificial intelligence, and he coined the term in this document, which was the proposal for this, this summer school. And it's very interesting to look back on this proposal because it's remarkable in, in many ways. Now, you probably can't read this, so I'm just going to read it uh, out to you. Uh, he says, uh, we propose that a two-month, 10-man study of artificial intelligence be carried out during the summer of 1956 at Dartmouth College. Um, the study is to proceed on the basis of the conjecture that every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence can, in principle, be so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it. An attempt will be made to find how to make machines use language, form abstractions and concepts, solve kinds of problems now reserved for humans, and improve themselves. We think that a significant advance can be made in one or more of these problems if a carefully selected group of scientists work on it together for a summer. <laughs> um, and this is, uh, this is a terrific document, uh, I have to say, in many reasons, but I think it's safe to say that, uh, that John McCarthy at that time seriously underestimated the difficulty of the problems that he, uh, that he was uh, setting out. Him, he with Marvin Minsky and Rochester and Claude Shannon, the father of information theory, were all the co-authors of this proposal. Um, and I just want to kind of actually have a couple of quotes from this remarkable uh, proposal. It's, a, it's only three or four pages long, but it really did anticipate the major paradigms of research in the field of artificial intelligence. So in particular, one, uh, the predominant paradigm in the 1980s, or up, uh, up to and including the 1980s, was so-called symbolic artificial intelligence, which is all about manipulating language-like representations and carrying out logic-like inference. Um, so, so in the proposal, it says, a large part of human thought consists of manipulating words according to rules of reasoning and rules of conjecture. From this point of view, forming a generalization consists of admitting a new word and some rules whereby sentences containing it imply and are implied by others. And that's really the essence of that one whole school of artificial intelligence that then dominated the field for a very long time. 
But there was a com always a competing sort of paradigm, which was the connectionist paradigm, much closer to neural networks, much closer to, to being uh, inspired by the workings of the brain. And that was very much anticipated uh, in the proposal as well. Uh, so first of all, um, uh, it, it, the, the proposal discusses, discusses machine learning. So he says, probably a truly intelligent machine will carry out activities uh, which may best be described as self-improvement. Some schemes for doing this have been proposed and are worth further study. So, uh, so here we are quite a few decades on, and we're still studying those, uh, those things. And indeed, many of the really largest challenges that face the field of artificial intelligence today were anticipated in this 1955 proposal for the, for the um, conference the following year, 1956. So for example, uh, uh, elsewhere in this little short document, it says, how can a set of hypothetical neurons be arranged so as to form concepts? Partial results have been obtained, but the problem needs more theoretical work. Um, you know, it's, uh, it, I mean, it certainly does, uh, you know, and that was 1955, and it's still very much the case. Um, a number of types of abstraction can be distinctly defined, and several others less distinctly, a direct attempt to classify these and to describe machine methods of forming abstractions from sensory and other data would seem worthwhile. Now, that is almost a perfect description of what is one of the main challenges to the whole neural network paradigm of machine learning, learning today. And that was from 1955. So it's very interesting in going, looking forward, also to look back. It's quite informative. OK, now people will be very aware, of course, and it's no doubt one of the reasons that I'm here, um, that, uh, that AI is a very hot topic and has attracted a great deal of attention recently. Um, but it hasn't always been uh, this way, and, um, and over the, the, the decades following the Dartmouth project, the Dartmouth conference in 1956, um, there's been a whole series of cycles of hype and disappointment, and hype and disappointment. And uh, the, the, the troughs of disappointment are often called AI winters, and really there was two AI winters. So following the early successes that came after the Dartmouth project, the first AI winter um, uh, occurred in the sort of in the um, early 70s um, and coincided with the publication of the Lighthill Report in the UK and other kind of um, somewhat de negative uh, uh, assessments of the outlook of the field. And, uh, and there, was a, there was a big lull in, uh, in, uh, in interest and in investment and so on. Oh, yeah. So when I first, um, when I first produced this slide, I, did, I, I didn't have anything on the, uh, uh, on the y-axis here. And one of the rules of my lab is that, you, you know, just don't ever come to me with a graph where the axes are not labeled. You know, it's an absolutely fundamental rule. And I realized as I was preparing for this talk that I had violated my own fundamental lab rule. So I have to put something on, you know, to label the, uh, the y-axis. I think, well, what the heck is the y-axis labeling, uh, you know, representing? Well, it's sort of something like scientific credibility and media interest and investment. All of those things, they all seem to be highly correlated. But don't ask me to tell you what the causal relations among those things are. OK, um, so then following uh, this first AI winter, there was then a, a, a great surge of investment, uh, partly driven by the Japanese and the Japanese fifth generation project, um, uh, which led to a lot of interest in so-called expert systems. Um, then th that didn't really quite live up to expectations, and there was a second AI winter uh, in, the, in the, the, the 90s. And it's really only uh, from the early 2010s that things really started to take off again. And things have started to take off largely thanks to the successes of um, an approach to machine learning called deep learning, which is based in neural networks. So that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about now. So that leads us to to the present. Oh, you'll notice, by the way, that this, uh, that this, that this curve goes off into the stratosphere, and I'm not going to you know, predict exactly what happens to it uh, after that point. Um, OK, so, um, so now I want to just to actually, um, so some of you, of course, will be very familiar with how neural networks, artificial neural networks work, uh, but uh, the majority won't. So I want to actually give you a little 
a brief sort of tutorial uh, on um, artificial neural networks about uh, explaining how they, how they work and um, the kinds of successes uh, that they've led to, to today. Um, so, uh, so a neural network is a collection of these very simple computational elements which are artificial neurons. And artificial neurons essentially uh, compute the weighted sum of a number of inputs. Uh, then they apply a non-linearity, such as a hyperbolic tangent or a rectifying linear unit or something like that. So they, there are various choices. They apply non-linearity, and then their output goes on to the next or to all the neurons that they're connected to. Now, in the typical arrangement that we see in, uh, in, in today's uh, neural networks, uh, we see a series of layers. So you'll see on the right-hand side here, uh, it shows a typical feed-forward net network. So into this network, on the left-hand side, that you have an input layer, and that's, that's where whatever input you're putting in uh, arrives. And then you have a number of hidden layers, and here I'm only showing one, um, uh, which are also neurons, and they're connected to uh, output layers, which also contain a number of neurons. Now, I'm only showing uh, one hidden layer, but the whole point of a so-called deep neural network, uh, which uh, is where the, the much hyped phrase deep learning comes from, uh, is, that there are m is that there are many, many layers that, that will learn to represent features of increasing abstraction. And so that's the key to, one of the keys to, to, uh, to why deep learning has been so, so successful. And it's a feed-forward network, so the flow of information is strictly from left to write in this diagram. I haven't shown the arrows on the connections, but it's, there's no, there are no feedback connections. And so in that respect, it's, it's pretty different from, uh, from the uh, kinds of networks we find in the brain that, for example, Danny Bassett was talking about uh, earlier on today. Um, OK, so that's, the, that's what an, an, a neural network looks like. And well, what can we do with that kind of neural network? Well, we can train it. Um, to, uh, to given a, a whole set of input-output pairs, we can train it to perform a computation that we might want it to perform. For example, to take an image and to label that image. And the way that we, so for example, to label that image with what's in the image, so a cat, a dog, a car, and so on. So here's the canonical example that you learn in, in, in neural networks 101, which is this handwritten uh, digit data set. And so the idea here is that uh, on, on the left-hand side, um, you see, uh, so, so, so ignore the one that's training data for, for the moment, and just look at the, at the digitized, the pixelated number two. So you pr present an image, which is, in this case, 28 by 28 pixels, to a set of uh, input neurons. That's your input layer, which is uh, the leftmost layer. Then you have a number of uh, hidden layers. In this case, I've just got one, which might contain, say, 30 neurons. And then you have a number of, uh, you have an output layer, and each neuron on the output layer uh, is, uh, represents the, is, it, you're going to train it to represent the digit that, you, that, that, that appears in the, in the image. So in this particular case, you're going to want, so there, there are going to be 10 of these output neurons in this particular case, so that you recognize the digits 0 to 9. And in this particular case, you're going to want the, uh, the digit that represents the number 2 to produce a, a high value and for all of the others to produce a low value, and that indicates that what you've got there is, a, is the number two. So the way that, uh, that these things are trained, sorry about the flicking backwards and forwards, uh, is, oh yes, okay, so as you'll see on this, the left-hand diagram here, as I point out, the way learning works is by adjusting all of the weights on the incoming connections to a neuron. So this neuron here, this represented by this circle, is going to compute the weighted sum of its inputs, if you recall, and these Ws are the weights. So they're the strengths of the incoming connections. And the way you train the neuron is by adjusting these weights up and down. And the way it works is that, uh, that uh, so suppose that we present this digit number two uh, as the input to this neural network, and then the, uh, at our output end, where if you start off with just a randomly a network with random weights, then the output is not going to be right most of the time. It's going to be it's going to tell you that it's a number that it isn't. And what you do is you work out the error in the output, and then you take the error in the output, and then what you really want to know is you want to know how to adjust all the weights to make this network a little bit better at recognizing that particular uh, image. So. It's all about, so mathematically speaking, it's all about understanding gradients. It's all about understanding uh, the gradient of the, of the error with respect to the weights 
in your network. And then having worked that out using calculus, using your calculus, so use a nice expression for that, because all of this is, is differentiable, then, uh, then you can adjust the weights a little bit to make it a little bit better at recognizing this particular image. And of course, if you just do that once, that's not going to, going to uh, uh, do very much. So, the, so what, you, what you really want to do is you want to have a very, very large amount of training data. And that's what we see on the left, a little sample of the training data. And the training data has to be, come with labels. So you have to know what the correct answer is. And then you feed all of this training data through your neural network. And for each little example, you adjust the weights a little bit, adjust the weights a little bit, adjust the weights a little bit. And the network gradually gets better and better and better at recognizing digits. And then, of course, you want to test it on examples it's never seen before. And eventually, you get something that's very, very good at recognizing, uh, recognizing these handwritten digits. So that's, uh, uh, so that's the way sort of neural networks work. And it's a tremendously useful um, uh, uh, a tremendously useful bit of technology. And one of the reasons it's become useful is because we, these days we can, th we can throw an enormous amount of computation at this problem, and we can train on very, very large quantities of data. So with this a simple uh, example like this, you have these little uh, simple digits, then it's not very difficult. But what we really want is more realistic images of, of, of uh, you know, that have objects in them, realistic sort of photographs, and you want to be able to label them. To do that, to learn on a larger data set, then you need a lot of data and a lot of computation. And that's really what led to the breakthrough um, that, that gives us the, that puts us where we are today, is being able to, to apply a large amount of computation to a large amount of, of training data. OK, so that's neural network learning. Reinforcement learning is a different kind of learning. That's basically learning by trial and error. So here we see the, uh, uh, the idea is that you've got an agent which is constantly getting observations from the environment and getting rewards and carrying out actions. And the idea is that this little agent, you want it to learn to carry out the actions that will maximize its reward over time. And that's called reinforcement learning. So it's the kind of learning we all do if we're sort of you know, learning to play tennis or something like that. You think, oh, that stroke worked. And that's even unconsciously, our brain is saying, oh, that's, I'll do that one again. And so that's sort of reinforcement learning. Now, a great, a great uh, a contribution that, uh, that DeepMind made um, uh, back, way back in about 2014, was to put these two ideas together. The idea of a deep neural network, so that's one of those neural networks of the sort that I described, with many, many layers, and to use that as the bit that's in the middle of this agent that works out what actions to perform given a particular input to maximize the reward over time. So that's so-called deep reinforcement learning, putting those two ideas together. And putting those two ideas together led to some pretty spectacular results. So the, the first was uh, the ability was to, to build a, a little network that was able, well, yeah, fairly you know, medium-sized these days, um, uh, uh, certainly not a large network by today's standards, but um, uh, that was able to learn to play these retro Atari video games like Space Invaders and Breakout and so on. Um, and this system just took as its input the raw pixels and the reward signal and learned how to get to you know, sort of the level of a top player in these games for a large number of games. Just sort of it would be given a completely new game, and then it would start training from scratch, and after a, a certain amount of time, it would be really good at that game. And basically, the same technology with some additional search uh, was then used, I mean, plus quite a lot of engineering, of course, um, uh, was used then and applied to the game of Go, which, as uh, you probably all know, uh, um, uh, uh, DeepMind's AlphaGo then defeated the world's sort of top Go players, um, uh, which is you know, a spectacular ach achievement. OK, so, that's, uh, so we've had uh, the past and that's sort of the present. But what about the future? Um, well, so this technology that's, that's been developed, this kind of uh, deep learning technology, neural networks, machine learning, uh, does have you know, considerable uh, uh, applications. It has a great many uses, for example, in manufacturing, scientific discovery, transport, healthcare, marketing. Google's quite interested in marketing. Um, so there are many applications uh, of this, uh, this sort of technology. But AI systems deployed in all of these sectors, today's AI systems, are, are all specialists. So, so basically, a new system needs to be put together 
the architecture designed, it needs to be trained from scratch for each application. And this is very different from human intelligence. So human intelligence, humans are generalists, and a general intelligence is able to perform a huge variety of tasks. So the same, very same system can, can, can apply itself to I, you know, us humans, can apply itself to an enormous number of different tasks, and some, very often with very, very little new data or new learning, we can apply ourselves to a new situation or a new task that we've never seen before. Now, the original goal of the field, the original goal of the, the field that was set out and was in the minds of those founders like John McCarthy back in the 1950s, was very much to build this kind of artificial general intelligence. Now, they didn't use that term in those days. That, the, that this, this term, artificial general intelligence, is a recent introduction to clearly distinguish this sort of holy grail of, of, a, of building a general AI from the more specialist applications that we have around at the moment. But that was certainly what they had in mind. And it's the kind of goal that, that, uh, uh, that you know, the most ambitious AI researchers still have in mind uh, today. Um, but there are quite a number of obstacles to achieving that kind of general artificial intelligence. And to be honest, we don't really know exactly what those obstacles are today. And if we did, we'd be a little bit further along the road to, to, to addressing them. Um, but I like to list, uh, so, so my favorite three that I like to list as I see it are these. So common sense, abstract concepts, and creativity. Um, so common sense, what I mean by common sense is an understanding of the everyday world and the consequences of actions that we might carry out in, in this everyday world. So just things like moving things around, picking things up. Um, the things that we, consequences on people as well, so the things that we say and social consequences, all of those kinds of things. Um, so having a, a, a deep understanding of that, which, uh, which when I say deep, it's the kind of thing that any child has by a certain age. And endowing uh, computers with that kind of common sense understanding of the everyday ordinary world is something we still haven't got there yet. So by abstract concepts, so this is related, a related uh, challenge. So, um, so the ability to, to build an abstract and acquire an abstract concept, what I mean by that is, is the ability to distill the essence of past experience and apply it in radically unfamiliar contexts. So just for example, the concept of a room, or a, I mean, this morning um, uh, uh, John O'Keefe was talking about a place as being a very abstract concept, and, in, and indeed it is a very abstract concept, but the concept of a room, of a building, of a table even, something to sit on. Those are all, you know, quite abstract concepts, and we don't at the moment and know, we know um, how to build networks that will take a picture of those things and will often label it correctly, but those systems don't have any real understanding of what those objects are for, uh, how they, uh, what the kind of um, role they take in ordinary human life, and, the, and you know, the real semantics of those, of those, those things. So we still don't really know how to build uh, build ne neural networks or any other kind of AI system that's able to, to acquire that, that kind of abstract concept from the ground up, from, from the raw data of interacting with the world. And then there's creativity, which I, I characterize as the productive yet open-ended propensity to try out new actions and ideas. And so there's the kind of thing that I'm not thinking about the kind of thing that Picasso or Schrodinger were good at. I'm thinking about the kind of thing that children are amazing at in just, just you know, the first few years of their, of their life. So those are the obstacles. Now, uh, now as you know, there, there, I'm, I've got two minutes left. And as you know, uh, there are no questions allowed uh, uh, in this. So I'm just going to give you the answers to all the questions <laughs> <coughs> which I know I always get at the end of these talks. So the first one, why build AGI at all? So current AI systems, um, as I alluded to in the previous slide, they lack a true understanding of the world and, and what it contains. So you know, a medical diagnosis system doesn't really know what a person is. And, and that lack of real understanding of what a person is is going to manifest itself in flaws and shortcomings and mistakes, uh, uh, you know, eventually. And similarly, an autonomous vehicle doesn't really know what a car is in, in, this, in the sense that we, that we do. Uh, and general intelligence goes hand in hand with true understanding. And that's a serious motive for trying to build, uh, uh, build um, you know, general intelligence. And in, in, in every domain where today we apply a specialist AI and, and artificial general intelligence would certainly be more capable and more robust for having a, more, having a, a real understanding of the world around it. 
And applying uh, AGI to a new domain would also not require the significant engineering effort that it does, that it does today. And finally, a, an artificial general intelligence would be able to make creative connections across domains, unlike uh, today's specialist AI. Now, here I've got 14 seconds left, according to this, but you're gonna, I'm going to go 30 seconds over um, to answer the questions that, you're all, uh, that, 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 people, that I always get. Okay? So the first one, will AGI be safe? Well, um, I have to say that the, the public can be very much misled by a certain alarmist AI narrative. We really don't know what AGI will be like if and when uh, we manage to build it. But I can tell you one thing that I don't think is applicable, which is the science fiction scenario where AI becomes self-aware and destroys humanity to protect itself. That's a very anthropomorphic version of artificial general intelligence. So I really do feel that uh, the, the Terminator images in articles about artificial intelligence should be banned. And uh, this is the only one that you're likely to see in any of my talks where it's grayed out with the word banned across it. Um, however, there are serious issues um, to do with uh, AGI, well, uh, many serious issues that are much more urgent to do with AI ethics, but that's not the topic of this, this talk. Um, but there are some serious issues to do with uh, AGI uh, safety, and they're really more to do with how we specify to a very powerful AI exactly what we want it to do in such a way that there won't be unintended uh, negative side effects, much as there are in, in, the, uh, uh, in the story of the Sorcerer's Apprentice. So that's a much more appropriate depiction of AI safety. And then, last slide. The other question I always get is, when will AGI happen? And I'm sorry to disappoint you, but although many people speculate, I really think no one knows. So I'm not going to give you a date, and I and don't believe any dates that you hear that people, uh, that people uh, put on, on this. Uh, now, um, of course, you know, somebody's going to be right, right? But right, they're just going to get lucky. So, um, so we really don't know. And this is how I kind of tend to characterize the situation. So imagine a timeline. And I think there's an, there is, we probably need a, a certain number of conceptual breakthroughs to achieve artificial general intelligence. And we don't even know what those breakthroughs are or how many there are. Moreover, we really don't know how long it will take to achieve those breakthroughs or what the, you know, what the intervals are between these, these breakthroughs. And between them, there'll be periods of steady progress. And I think we're probably at the moment in a period of, of steady progress and we were awaiting some unknown sequence of conceptual breakthroughs to happen before we achieve AGI. So, so the long and the short of it is, if you are worried about AGI safety, well, you don't need to panic just yet. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much.